the it was a national review and and it the report was completed a couple of years ago and, and it focused on the state of policing in indigenous communities and the role of policing within Canada. But also, you know, the report contributes to the broader uh, examination of Canada's relationship with indigenous communities. And, and uh, you know, it just builds on from, from the research that was done in policing Canada in the 21st century. And, and it also focuses on, you know, some of those promising and leading practices, you know, that policing could be applied in the Aboriginal community. So that was one of the opportunities they had. And the focus is, you know, a need to really understand our, you know, each other a little better, really understand how to focus on, on delivering that culturally safe and responsive uh, delivery of police services and, and gain that level of, of knowledge and understanding of who we're delivering that service for. And, and that's, that's how we connect and that's how we move forward, as Dan mentioned, in, in focus on reconciliation. So with that, I'll, I'll start the prayer and, and, uh, and then uh, I just want to thank you for, for hearing these words. So with that, you know, I, I just want to honor the creator today and give thanks and then ask creator for, you know, to watch over all of us and, and, and for, for the opportunity to be able to hear each and everyone's voice and, and be able to, you know, gain that clarity as to an understanding as to, you know, what, what the conversation is today and, and possibly tools that we can help move forward with. So with that, I'll start my prayer. Creator. Great Spirit, Grandfather, Ninna, you're known by many loving names. I come before you in a humble manner, with tears in my eyes, ancient song in my heart. I pray to the powers of creation, to grandf Grandfather Sun, to your mother, and to the Grandmother Moon and Mother Earth, and to my ancestors, the holy grandmothers and grandfathers, and to my I pray for my relations in nature, all those that fly, swim, crawl, and walk, the ones that are seen and unseen, and to the good spirits that exist in every part of creation. Thank you, Creator, for this beautiful day and the beautiful life you've given us and, and the opportunity to, to be part of, of the miracles each and every day. You know, the new life that's grown around us as, as spring takes shape and, and, you know, it's that uh, renewal of life that's so special. We give thanks for that, Creator. We give thanks for, for the many gifts you've given us, this, the sacred ceremonies, the holy songs, being able to come to you in prayer, and also the medicines that you provide, not only to the Indigenous people, but to all people that need healing. Creator, I just ask you to get, be with us today as we gather here. I pray that we come with open minds and open hearts and we're able to feel safe and, and, and be able to voice you know, our questions or be able to, to have clarity as to the conversation as it moves on. Help us today and, and uh, help us with you know, being able to to share and able to learn from each other. Creator, I ask you to be with us today and watch over all the people that are on the call because we all come from many, many different places, you know, within uh, North America. And I ask you to watch over us. And we just give thanks for, you know, the land that we're, we're calling in from. And, and, and I pray that we take the time to get to know the people that, were, that walked this land before us. And Creator, please be with us. And we give thanks for the many things you've given us. Ask, ask for beauty above us. Ask for beauty below us. Ask for beauty around us. And ask for beauty in each and every one of us, Creator. Creator, please hear these prayers and, and be with us today. And, and watch over our families too. All my relations, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, and opening this uh... Uh, panel in a good way. 
Um, our first presenter is Kelly Tamaklo. Um, he's a former Edmonton Police Commissioner, uh, forward thinker. Uh, it's a it's a video recorded pre recorded session, um, but I will just say this that I have been fortunate to get to know uh, Mr. Tamaklo, Chief Tamaklo, over the course of my career um, when I was with the Edmonton Police Service, and he is an exceptional individual who has a great understanding of what needs to happen uh, for policing to um, evolve. So with that, um, I will, we will put a video up on that. Give me, two, give us two seconds. I am Toby Yahutamaklo the sixth. I'm a founding member and a vice president for the Coalition for the Canadian Police Reform. I'm a former police commissioner in the city of Edmonton, Alberta. For over two decades, I served as a First Nations and a municipal chief administrative officer. I've also consulted for and chaired many organizations. I hold a master's in business administration. Our topic for today's webinar is what is 21st century policing? To address this, we can expand our thinking and problem solving capabilities by leveraging and tapping into ideas and processes that emerge from our rich, diverse, and multicultural society. One such powerful idea, perspective and approach to viewing and working with an increasingly more diverse society, elevated globally by leaders like President Nelson Mandela and Bishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa is Ubuntu. Ubuntu says, I am because you are. Can Ubuntu be enough in approaching challenging issues of policing? Policing is an integral part of our democracy. Policing exists to serve and protect our communities. Over time, our societies have undergone changes and have become more diverse and multicultural. The incidence of mental challenges has increased. Homelessness is on the rise. To deal with the nature of this new and complex society, there's the need for more and more professionally trained people. The concept of Ubuntu requires one to be attuned to and to develop a natural emotional intelligence and worldview to put oneself in others' shoes. To understand others' perspective and to work together with others to co-create solutions that preserve the common human dignity to be each other's keeper. If policing is to be effective, it needs to professionally adapt to the societal needs of the 21st century and to adopt a more highly communicative, intercultural, multicultural, and interpersonal approaches and to explore 
and borrow from proactive diversity and rich ideas such as Ubuntu. When I became a police commissioner in 2011, I quickly learned a lot about the police. My earlier fears and cynicism about the police were replaced by a high sense of respect for them. I saw at close hand, I saw them at close hand, presenting themselves very well at our commission meetings. I went on a ride along with them across the city. I flew on Air One helicopter with them as they provided night security safety for the people of Edmonton. I saw the endless sacrifice of beat officers on the street and their, their love of their community. I attended their barbecues and spoke directly with them. They were humans like us. I saw their humanity, which also included their vulnerability. They had their good days and they had their bad days. They were high achievers. It is stated that only 2% of our community members can ever become police officers. In my earlier experiences, I also noted what happens when we fail to provide adequate professional development training to our police. I recall for, from my 13 years of serving and living on an indigenous First Nations community as a chief executive officer in 1995. The community was pleased by the RCMP. It was difficult for the RCMP to provide effective service due to the call distance. It usually took about an hour to arrive at the scene of the incident. To address the problem of distance, the new police officers were employed and required to live in the First Nations community. It was an impossible environment for the police to thrive in. They were not professionally trained for it. These challenges ultimately led to the creation of one of the first tripartite police involving the feds, the province, and the First Nations. This arrangement meant community members were now employed and trained as police officers headed by the RCMP Chief of Police. Today, we have several self-administered administered police for many First Nation communities to effectively serve the needs of the indigenous population. This is an effort to address the lack of 21st century professional training standards. In 2010, there was an increased outrage by the Somalis in Edmonton. The Somalis perceived that the police were not treating their homicides fairly. There were several homicides of Somali men with very low clearance rates. When I became police commissioner in the city of Edmonton, my first request was for a breakdown in the homicides by demographics, as well as a breakdown of the clearance rates by demographics. I began to make sense of the differentials in the rates of the homicidal solutions. It was perceived by the Somalis that the police did not understand their culture and therefore their investigative methods were futile. 
their continuous request is for the hiring of police officers who were community members, who spoke their language, who understood their culture. This request may as well speak to the need for 21st century police professional training standards. In May of 2010, the whole world came to a shocking standstill with the brutal murder of George Floyd by the police. There were other police deadly use of force that led to the loss of lives of people such as Richard Brooks, Levy Rodney, Chantel Moore, Michael Brown, and many others. Dr. John Lilly, a former medical doctor and a former police commissioner, and Dave Cassells, an international police consultant and a former police chief, both wrote op-eds speaking to an obvious solution the need to professionally train our police officers in Canada and to standardize their training via a national college. This will not only provide economies of scale, but also provide a single avenue for continuous improvement through evidence-based research for use by all police agencies in Canada. I concur with this reasoning. I presented to the mayor and council of the city of Edmonton and sent to them our work titled Black Africans Policing and Government, edited by Dr. Sinceta Pilani. It is estimated that majority of people killed by police shooting are young male between 20 and 40, giving the fact that our youth are our next leaders. This places a burden on us to find a solution to this problem. The arrest and incarceration of mentally challenged and homeless people require new professional and resource increased approaches. The call for the use of the concept of Ubuntu to address the issue of compassion in policing is a long-awaited one. The police exist because of the community. We exist because of others. This simple but complex construct can only be achieved in the medium of an increased professional environment with high emotional intelligence, communication, multicultural and interpersonal trained personnel. Thank you. That was uh, a, a great start. Uh, I thank uh, Mr. Tumako for that. That was great. Um, our next speaker uh, is another person who has inspired me and uh, given me some advice over the few years. Um, uh, Devon Clunas, the former ins uh, Inspector General of Police in Ontario and the former uh, Police Chief in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, an actual absolute leader in advancing policing, um, not just in Canada, but across the world. Um, and we're very lucky to have him here today. So uh, Devon, uh, without further ado, please, please go ahead. So Dan, thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me well. And I was telling Dan in the chat that I've, I've been on the road all day, driving from Houston, Texas. I'm currently in Mobile, Alabama. Hopefully tomorrow I'll get to Florida, but I'm doing some work down here in the U.S. And last night I was facilitating a number of uh, community engagement sessions. Uh, in the daytime, I facilitated a number of sessions with police officers. So it's all about really building this relationship. And on the drive here, I was thinking, why are we still doing this? Why are all these retired people still putting in their time so much with so much passion looking at policing? And I really want you to think about that. Uh, we're not doing this because we want to get paid. I tell people very clearly, no, we have a good pension. This is about something much bigger than ourselves. It really is about a greater purpose. It's about the future. It's about what we see happening to society. And I typically like to say, we realize a significant role that effective policing plays 
really in a civil society. And that's what this is about for us. So how do we ensure that going forward, we leave this world in a much better place for her children and her grandchildren. And I look at the, the pain that so many police officers are experiencing today and, and so many within the community. And I think we collectively can do something about that. So when we hear the term 21st century policing and, and people talk about standardization and modernizing policing, that's what I want to talk about. I think sometimes people, when they hear the term 21st century policing, they may think we're talking about something which is radically different. Maybe it's a, an experimentation of what we have come to understood at policing. Uh, and I typically like to tell people that really, many of you might have heard the saying that there really is nothing new under the sun. And really, when we talk about policing, that's exactly how I see it. We're not talking about something that's radical. If anything, I say, in order for us to get to 21st century policing, we really need to go backwards. We need to go back to what's really the foundational roots of what policing is all about. And let me explain what I mean. The modern constructs of policing, as you and I understand it, many of you know it, is founded on Sir Robert Peel in 1829. I know that all of you, you, all of you have heard about his nine principles of policing. I'm not gonna waste time telling you about that. But the foundation of those principles is that police derive, and, and you heard the chief talk about this in, in his speech, we derive our legitimacy, our authority from the public and the public's approval of how we police them, so to speak, right? How we interact and how we engage. And I can tell you in all of the work that I'm doing in our country and here in the US, and as recently as last night, that's what I hear the community consistently calling for. We want to have that engagement with the police. So it's not really radical what we're talking about. I think we can all agree that over the last number of years, and particularly after George Floyd, there's been this massive disconnect between police and the community. And hear me clearly, we're not saying the entire populace is at this place, but it's significant enough that we have to stop, we have to take pause, and we have to assess the particular path that we're on. And I think we will all agree that it's not the path that we desire. And so when you think about 21st century policing, here's what I'm saying. 21st century police instead is built on these particular six principles. It talks about building trust and legitimacy, greater policy and oversight, uh, greater use of technology and social media. And part of what I'm hearing consistently from the community is this, is that we don't know why the police do the things they do. Or when things really go wrong, there is this silence. So we're failing to actually educate the public, properly communicate with the public, so they have no understanding of what it is that we're doing. So Part of 21st century policing is saying that let's be more open and transparent and share those things. I can tell you when I arrived in the chief's chair, one of the things that really frustrated me was when something significant happened in the community and I would say, let's talk about it. And those who are more senior to me with more experience would say, no, we can't. And so I would pose the question, why can't we? Is it going to jeopardize the investigation? No. Then why are we not sharing it with the public? That's how we've done it in the past. So 21st century is more about that openness and that transparency and sharing what we can. And then we're hearing from the community that we want more of what we call it community policing. And, and what I'm hearing consistently here in the work that I'm doing is that officers are just going from call to call to call. They have no time to be significantly engaging with the public. And it's the same thing in our country. And I think it's really interesting to realize that the dynamics that I'm hearing in the U.S., are exactly the dynamics that I'm hearing in our country. There's a real consistency there. And then we talk about the officer training. Like when I started in a police academy 35 plus years ago, it was a different standard of training, but we can see that it's really accelerated over the years. During our time, very few individuals had university degrees. We know that the vast majority, and Dan will certainly align with this, they have university degrees, so we need to be focusing on that, actually advancing the training, the education. And something, again, when I started, officer wellness, nobody talked about officer wellness, but I can tell you what I'm hearing from in the community right now is that they care about the wellness of our officers, and I also know that the officers are hurting. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about 21st century policing. It's something that all, that really resonates with the officers, resonates with the community, but we now as leaders really have to adapt and, and take a hold of this. So these are all very laudable principles, but like I said, go back to what Sir Robert Peel talked about almost 200 years ago. The fact that we have to be closely connected with the community, have them really appraise what we're doing, 
and we are actually being a service to the community. I think for too long, policing has seen itself kind of like an island unto ourselves. I can tell you when I arrived in Ontario in the fall of 2020 to take on the role of the position of Inspector General of Policing, the direction that we were moving in was that we were going to be more of the police of the police. And I thought, no, that is not what we want to do. It's going to be about us building that relationship, the inspectorate building a relationship with the police, the police building that very strong relationship with the community. So I said, I saw it more as a symbiotic relationship where what happens in one part of the system impacts the other. And the only way that the entire whole will be healthy, right? You can't just focus on one part. We have to realize that it is a collective. So that's critically important. For me, that's what 21st century policing is all about. So we know instinctively that in order for us to build that trust, you have to have a relationship. And a relationship isn't built only in a time of crisis. I really think that's part of what we're missing in policing. People say we typically only see the police when there are really bad things happening. And I really appreciate that. It's about the staffing, that we have to have the right number of staff and we can't just be going from call to call to call to call. That does, doesn't work in 21st century policing. And so, as I said, it's not really complex. Sometimes we really overcomplicate things which are very simple. What people are asking for more than anything is that they really want to get to know their police officers. So, so when we hear the call that people are saying that we need to defund or disband, that is not really what people desire. And I often tell people, think about what your community would be like just for an hour, a day without police. And then that really gets people to a very sober and point that no, we need the police in our lives. Now, I, ironically, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, no one stopped and said, you know what, that is just a US issue, right? It's not just a local issue. That issue reached out and touched every single one of us. So when I think about why we're not able to get to this place of having standardization in policing, I have sat at the tables with respective chiefs, people who I really respect. And I've heard individuals simply say things like this, Devon, we're just not there yet. Uh, Devon, you know, policing is a provincial responsibility. Let me ask you, when George Floyd erupted, did it remain only in Minneapolis or only in a particular state? Did it not impact every single nation just about right across the entire globe? Let me tell you this about Canadian policing. I've said it consistently. I believe that we have some of the best policing on the planet and it has served us incredibly well in the past. But as we look forward to what we all desire to achieve in terms of policing, we know what the standard needs to be. We can't simply keep saying, well, that's just the responsible responsibility of the provinces or a particular jurisdiction. As I said, what happened in the United States in Minneapolis impacted all of us. The only insulation, if we wanna use a medical uh, analogy to this, the only inoculation we have because incidents like this will occur again in the future, the only real inoculation we have is to have standardization in terms of the training, the practices, the pursuit of excellence in policing, and that requires standardization. As I travel across our beautiful country, there is no reason that I should receive a different standard of policing in the East Coast than I would in Manitoba, than I would on the West. And I have to be honest, it will not occur if we simply say that we're going to leave it up to each jurisdiction to do it themselves, because if we were able to do that, we would have done it already. And let me say this clearly, when we're talking about a college of policing, we're not talking about taking away authority and responsibility from any other institution which is currently constituted in our nation. What we're saying is that the College of Police will, not, will actually help those other organizations because they can only do so much. No one organization can do it all. And I'm talking again about the symbiotic nature of the relationship that we need to have the college can do its work, the other institutions can do their work, but the real benefactors of this will be the police officers who I know are seriously hurting right now. They really are. They're looking for hope. This can be the hope. And the end game will be that will be a better police services that will have right across the country for the citizens that we serve. There is no way that we can continue with status quo. 
status quo is not serving us effectively. I am seeing it right across all of North America. And I can tell you the desire is there for this change. The need is there. And right now is an opportune time. If we do anything less than institute a national college of policing, I think the next generation will look back on us and say that we were a great failure. We cannot miss this opportunity. So I look forward to the rest of this discussion and to the ongoing implementation. And I'm very optimistic that this will come to fruition, that the college, national college within our country will set the standard for policing right across the globe. The same way one event in Minneapolis impacted the globe, I think we can be the light that will shine for the entire globe in terms of effective police and community. So thank you very much. Those are my own comments. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Devon. That was uh, exceptional. And I, 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 100% agree with you. So <laughs> thank you very much for those very, very amazing words. And I, and I really appreciate your, your thoughtfulness you. and your experience. Uh, our next, our next presenter is Professor Scott Blanford of Wilfrid Laurier University. So I look forward to hearing uh, Professor Blanford speak. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that and the opportunity to speak with you tonight. And uh, I wouldn't be a professor if I didn't have a presentation to show. So I'm just gonna quickly bring this up and uh, just to help keep me on track and make sure I hit some of the key points that I wanted to share with you tonight. And I'm gonna speak specifically to the path to police professionalization. And this is a somewhat controversial topic because uh, I'm somewhat of a heretic in policing in that I suggest that policing has not yet reached the level of a true profession. And so I wanted to speak about that and, and sort of justify some of my thoughts about it and, and give some ideas about where we could go to, to reach that level. And why is this important? Well, things have changed. Uh, I started policing in 1982. And at that time, you had to have a grade 12 education. And it wasn't that much uh, before that where grade 10 was sufficient for getting into policing. And those that had a college diploma or a university degree were, were quite the rarity. And uh, in fact, they were somewhat looked down upon by the, the crusty old salts who thought that you don't need a, a degree uh, to be a police officer, you just need common sense. And when you look back, and, and I did some research and I actually found an interesting stat that kind of stunned me, but at the time of the First World War, only two out of three police officers had completed grade school, let alone high school. And at the time of World War I, 75% of police officers could not pass a basic army intelligence test. So that was a little over 100 years ago. Uh, but really, Education has never really been at the forefront of policing, but it's becoming more and more important because people are starting to realize the need uh, to develop competencies with increased globalization across the world, uh, increased uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, skills that are required, the, the demographics of our country. We need to be more receptive, more open. And so education becomes a very key component to that. And a number of authors and, and councils, et cetera, have looked at what is changing in policing, particularly when it comes to that move towards professionalization. And uh, one author suggested that law enforcement, if it's gonna be considered a, a profession, needs a university degree in order to legitimize it. Others have suggested that it requires specialized skills and trainings and certain levels of transparency and accountability. So there, things have changed very much in the last 30, 40 years in policing. So the question then becomes, what actually makes a job, a profession? And there's a number of definitions that are out there, but one that sort of encompasses where I, I think we should be going, uh, looks at these different factors. One is advanced education and training. Currently, uh, in Ontario at least, and, and pretty much across the country through my research, in order to be a police officer, high school education is generally accepted minimum by legislation. But recruiters, and I did some time in recruiting, uh, they will be looking for those people that have some form of post-secondary education, but it's a very broad uh, stroke that they take to it. It's not that it has to be a, a degree or a diploma within the field or in, within a discipline. It's just that they've had post-secondary education. Also, there's a requirement to have an ethics code, a code of ethics that governs the practice of that particular profession. Autonomy, the ability to self-regulate that's always going to be a challenge for policing because of the need for public accountability, uh, civilian and government oversight. So the autonomy factor will always be difficult to achieve, but that is considered to be one tenant of a profession. 
Also, there has to be a contribution to the public good. It has to serve a purpose. And policing, I, I would suggest, is a very noble uh, a public good in that it certainly serves a purpose. And as uh, uh, Devana just uh, referred to, if you take away policing even for one day, just the, the anarchy that could uh, come from that would be quite overwhelming. There has to be standards of practice. In Canada, and, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but the the uh, Constitution Act, Section 91, Section 92, differentiated the powers and, and provided policing at the federal level as well as the provincial level. But there should be an expectation from a person who lives in St. John, uh, Newfoundland, and someone who lives in Vancouver, BC, that they're going to receive the same level of service from a police officer. There should be that standardization. And currently, there isn't. There's within quite broad parameters, but there's nothing that's that specific about what exactly are the expectations for a police officer. And then lastly, the component is a contribution to the body of knowledge. That is research. It's research that can be used to continue to improve the process of policing. So those are considered to be the main tenets of what makes a job a profession. And I would suggest that in a couple of those areas, policing has not yet met that standard. One of the things that I have to keep in mind, and when people talk about you know, police officers being highly trained and, and such, I have no doubt that they are. I, I, myself as a tactical officer, I went on a, just an incredible number of courses to improve my skill sets. But there is a difference between training and education. And I would suggest that training tells you what to do. It gives you those job specific technical knowledge, skills and abilities. Whereas education tells you why you do it. It gives you not only the knowledge, but critical thinking skills and judgment. And there've been a number of studies that have suggested that police officers with university degrees have uh, higher levels of tolerance for diversity. They're less likely to resort to excessive force. And one that was rather interesting was they tend to take less time off uh, for sick time, which I don't quite see the correlation, but it is in there. But there is a difference between training and education. There's also a difference between a, a code of ethics or an ethics code and a code of conduct. Every province and the RCMP Act lays out a code of conduct for officers. Those are the things that they should or should not be doing uh, in the execution of their duties. But that is different than a code of ethics. And I, I look back to one of my first training officers uh, trying to, to explain the difference to me, he said, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And a code of conduct may allow you to do something, but an ethics code questions, should you do that? And so that is something that is currently lacking. There's no standardized code of ethics in policing. It's left up to provincial legislation and it's left up to individual policies and procedures within the individual organization. So a standardized code of ethics across the country would help move towards that professionalization. Now, in doing my research, this was a, a matrix that I put together that I found to be very interesting. And I tried to identify what were some of the uh, occupations that were similar to a police officers and what were their levels of education relative to that. So I chose police officer, a military police officer, a military officer in general, a registered nurse, a teacher, and a lawyer. And those are somewhat com comparative uh, types of professions. And I've highlighted registered nurse, teacher, and lawyer because they all have professional associations or requirements for a right to practice, basically legislated uh, licensing where they have to meet certain standards in order to practice. Now, when I looked at the different levels of education, I found that a police officer generally across the provinces generally results in about seven months of training and on the job training in order to be put out on the street. That includes a period of training that uh, in our case in Ontario, the Ontario Police College, uh, field training, training within your own organization, and then supervision by a coach officer and a supervisor through your probationary period. A military police officer is required to have at least a two year college diploma. And again, with their additional training, a military officer is required to have a university degree, resulting in about five years with on-the-job training. A registered nurse, approximately five years with a degree, a degree I might add in nursing. You don't have many nurses with a degree in geography. A teacher, again, a university degree, plus one year, now two years in Ontario in order to achieve their Bachelor of Education uh, in order to teach. And then of course, a lawyer, uh, a bit more education up to seven years. So when you look at the bottom line, you'll see that a police officer can be on the street with the authority to take away a person's liberty to use deadly force with seven months of training and education. And a teacher has six years. 
And it struck me quite, uh, quite abruptly that a teacher who can give my son or daughter a detention has six years of education, but the police officer who can arrest and detain my son or daughter or potentially use lethal force has seven months. So that, that, that was kind of a stark uh, contrast between those types of professions. So where does that take us? Well, again, when I say that police have not yet reached that level of professionalization, uh, people get upset, police officers in particular. Oh, we're, we're professional. Definitely we're a profession. I'm, I'm a member of the policing profession. Well, no one's saying that police are not professional. Uh, as as Vaughn had indicated, we have some of the best police officers in, in the world. But just because you're professional, the verb, does not mean that you are actually a profession, the noun, because those, those standards have not yet been met. But their expectation or their perception of what they're doing is that straight arrow that, yes, we are a profession. But in reality, because of the way the, the legislation is and the way the police services are structured across Canada, it's a real disconnect between them. So how do we straighten that line out in the reality and make it look a little bit more like that expectations and perception line? Well, I think the way to do it is to look at what are some of the disconnects and then look at solutions to those disconnects. One of them is the legislation, as I alluded to, Section 91, Section 92 of the Constitution, with the division of powers set policing as a federal and also a provincial uh, responsibility. And there's a disconnect between the two. The RCMP have different levels of, of uh, service, have different standards, different recruiting requirements, different promotional processes compared to provincial police services who are then again different to municipal. And I talk about those being in silos. There's those vertical and horizontal silos. We also have obviously the politicization of policing. And it, it is a very controversial topic, particularly now with some of the things that have been happening uh, in the world. So politics will always be a component to that. Uh, my junkyard dog, that signifies the fact that there are those, you know, parochial concerns where, uh, you know, as alluded to before, that chiefs of police say we're not ready for that or we don't want to do that because that doesn't work for our community. Uh, so there's that protectionism of their own area. So there's not an openness to looking at how can we improve things and how can we move this forward. You also have your internal resistance. Not sure which way to go. Officers saying, you know, we've always done it that way. It's worked fine. Why do we have to change? So there's that internal resistance that has to be overcome. And the last little uh, picture I have there talks about the apprenticeship. And, and this is something that when you point this out to police officers, uh, that being the difference between a, a profession and an apprenticeship, when you talk about the training model, recruits are hired. They're sent down for a short period of training to a police college, police academy. They're brought back, they're given some in-class uh, training, and then they're put out with a field officer, a coach officer. That is an apprenticeship model. That's exactly what an apprentice plumber or an apprentice electrician would do. So we have that model of training and it's worked for many, many years, but can we do things to improve that and move beyond that apprenticeship model and move policing towards professionalization? Well, I would suggest, as has already been mentioned before, the establishment of a college of policing and not a college of policing in the sense that it's going to be a training facility or an education facility, but it's more of a strategic oversight and a, it creates that contribution to the body of knowledge. When we talk about colleges, we talk about the uh, Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, the College of Nurses, the Law Society of Ontario, and the UK model, which uh, I think is a very good model that we should be looking closely at for their college of policing. And these organizations exist to, to consolidate, to strategize, to, to create standards, to provide code of ethics for the, the, their different professions. And policing doesn't have that. It's a very disconnected, very disjointed uh, relationship between police organizations in the country. And I think that's something that would be well served by moving towards a college of policing model. Now, the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform obviously is leading the, the charge for this, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with it. And this was one of the results of my research, looking at the creation of a college of policing. Again, not to be a training facility, but to be a, a clearinghouse of information, a strategic partner in developing standards uh, and, and helping police organizations to move forward into that 21st century uh, mode of service delivery. Now, there are two ways that this can be approached. One can be, as, as the top indicates, uh, top photo, uh, laws, rules, regulations, compliance. It could be a regulatory body. 
But I think there's enough regulation for policing as it is. We have enough civilian oversight and government oversight and, and such. So I don't see the need for the College of Policing being a oversight in regards to regulations. However, I do think that certification or licensing should be a component. A right to practice is something that should be incorporated into a College of Policing. It's quite common in the States. Uh, if you you know, are, are fired from a police service or you're facing criminal charges, they revoke your license to, to police. And currently in Ontario, for example, if you're facing uh, police service charges, uh, police act charges, you can simply avoid those by quitting from your police organization and then moving on to another police organization. And if they hire you, that baggage sort of disappears. But if you were licensed like a teacher, a lawyer, a nurse, and as part of that uh, Police Services Act uh, tribunal, your right to practice was removed, that would remove a number of issues for policing and for police organizations when they're looking to hire people. So that is a component I think that needs to be built in. But I prefer actually the bottom model where the College of Policing would serve as a, a support for policing. It would help develop standards, the different competency levels uh, required for police officers at various ranks within the organization. It would help uh, create partnerships between academic institutions and police organizations to really research some of these issues and come up with some really concrete recommendations that can be operationalized. And I think that is the way to go where it's more of a uh, advisory consultancy role as opposed to a regulatory role. But the College of Policing, I think, is something that is well uh, past its due date for policing, it will certainly serve to move policing forward towards the professionalization that I think uh, policing is, is well deserved of. It, it has so many of the tenets of a profession, but it just hasn't quite reached it. And I think the College of Policing is one of those vehicles that can be used to help us get there. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Dan and uh, thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Professor. That was great, and I really appreciated the the, the graphics. It, it was uh, it was uh, a nice way to kind of get us there, and I and and it's a great concept and great. And I like how you highlighted the College of Policing in the UK. Spending some time over there myself, I've seen some so how that works in a really really amazing way. Um, our next presenter is Elaine Babineau, a retired RCMP staff sergeant and a racial and social profiling expert. And this is the first time I got to meet Elaine, so. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your, your speak. Well, thank you very much, uh, my friend, Don. Um, well, first of all, good, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, greetings from uh, New Jersey. I know folks say that nobody goes on vacation in New Jersey, but here I am in New Jersey visiting some family and uh, attending a conference on social justice. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my talk this evening is about uh, one's perception is their reality. Uh, first of all, we have to understand one thing, the nobility of policing. I usually use the term the nobility of policing because to me, policing is a noble profession. Uh, why? It's because every single action posed by a police officer undeniably will have an impact on someone, either positively or negatively. That's how important being a police officer is. Uh, no pressure, folks, but that's what it is. Um, as I said, the title of my intervention this evening is One's Perception is Their, their Reality. To start with, I'm going to throw a number of statistics at you, so bear with me, okay? According to the 2020 Canadian General Social Survey, the GSS, uh, on social identity, one in five Black people, that is 21%, and Indigenous people, 22%, have little or no confidence in the police. Let that sink in for a minute. This is actually twice the proportion of non-Indigenous and non-visible minority population. That's pretty tough thing to hear. Furthermore, about one in three Black person, that is 30%, and one in three Indigenous person, that is 32%, said that police were performing poorly in at least one part of their job a much higher proportion than non-Indigenous, non-visible minority at 19%. According to a similar survey on Canadian safety, nearly half, that is 46% of Black people 
and First Nation people at 44% aged 15 years and older said that they had experienced discrimination in, in the five years preceding the survey compared to 16% on non-Indigenous, non-visible minority population. That's a whole lot of stats, but I'm just throwing it at you. Among those that were discriminated against, 21% of Indigenous people and 16 of Black people said that they had, um, that it had happened when dealing with the police compared to 4% of non-Indigenous, non-visible minority people who experienced discrimination. That's four times the rate of discrimination for Black and Indigenous people. However, on the positive swing, the good news is that the majority of all people, regardless of race, who actually had contact with the police felt that their interactions were positive. So what does that mean? Let's look at behind the stats now. Let's look at the context. As I said before, one's perception can be based on a number of factors, including direct or personal experience, the influence of others, or the influence of the media, both traditional and social. The public often form their opinions from criminal and law enforcement based on social media depiction. Some researchers do agree uh, do acknowledge rather that media influences police perspectives, but claim factors like race, prior experiences with the police, and involvement in the criminal justice system matter more. This is to say that past experiences shape how they perceive controversial instances uh, in the media. For example, and uh, uh, Devin uh, alluded to this in his uh, speech, but I'll, I'll say it again. For example, considering um, some of the controversial incidents that have taken place both in the United States and Canada, by the way, this is not a US thing, this is a Canadian thing as well, there has been more scrutiny on the police, and in some cases, a powerful resistance towards police. Regardless of the perception of perception or reality, the fact remains that the lack of public confidence in the police or perception that it is performing poorly can have a number of negative impacts, including a reduction of quality of services provided or a deterioration in the relationship between the institution and the public it is supposed to serve. It can even affect recruiting. For example, it was reported no later than this week that applications to join the RCMP are down 50% and projected to worsen. But what I say to this is if you build it, it will come. So where do we go from here? Well, a recent study conducted in the United States confirmed that intensive training in procedural justice, or PJ, can lead to more procedural, procedurally just behavior and less disrespectful treatment of people at high crime places. Procedural justice involves, and note this, involves fair and respectful treatment of people by police, giving voice to them, showing them neutrality, treating people with dignity and respect, and evidencing trustworthy motives. For example, the study showed that PJ interventions reduce arrests by police officers, positively influence, reduce arrests by police officers, positively influence residents' perception of police harassment and violence, and reduce crime. They use a randomized uh, trial approach, uh, basically, to study further than, their, their, their research was randomized trial approach, and their study further demonstrated that to the potential of PJ training is not simply to encourage fair and respectful policing, but also to provide evaluations of police and crime prevention effectiveness. From a 21st century policing perspective, I strongly believe that standardizing training across the country while holding organizations to high professional standards of service delivery, particularly in procedural, uh, procedural justice, is an uncontrovertible starting point. And there's no 
there's no tension between the federal and the provincial because policing is a dual responsibility under the, uh, the, uh, the, under the, um, uh, the Constitution. Procedural uh, justice can help to not only enhance the legitimacy of profession amongst vulnerable communities and attract their members to a career in law enforcement. I repeat, procedural justice can help recruit people from vulnerable communities. But also it helps police officers to feel a sense of appreciation once again from those communities for the thankless work that they do day in and day out. That's, that's like actually a way to address the serious issue of depolicing folks, which is a reality in policing today. In 21st uh, century policing, we can't deny that. So getting back to our Ubuntu as being humanity to others, uh, let's not forget one of appeals principle that says that the police uh, are the people, and the people uh, is the police. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alain. That was uh, outstanding, and I really love bringing that uh, the research on the procedural justice into into play. There, that's that's uh, the procedural justice piece is so important. And if we did follow that, we build police legitimacy, and if we build police legitimacy, we reduce crime. And I don't think we've taught our police officers enough about that so thank you very much for that so i'm going to take a few minutes here just to chat about kind of some things that i've seen over the past 25 years and 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 what i think we need to do to advance 21st century policing and i do agree that standardized training is of, of utmost importance but i also think how we train is of importance too and i think this is where standardization comes into play to this day, we still see in a lot of police training facilities, when we talk about officer safety, we, we teach police officers that everyone's a threat because you always, and officer safety is of utmost importance, and it is. I'm not saying it isn't. But when we do that and we blade our bodies with our gun side back and our hands are at the ready, even we're holding our notebooks and, and we have that posture, um, are we potentially creating our own um, situations that we that we don't need to create? As we've seen over time, and the murder of George Floyd highlighted, along with several other police shootings uh, and killings that were seen as inappropriate, but this isn't new. Um, we look back to 1991 and the, the uh, beating of Rodney King and the acquittal of the individuals in that case. And you look at that's where, if you look at police legitimacy as a tipping point where the public stopped caring about uh, criminal deterrence as much and started to care about the legitimate actions or illegitimate actions of police officers. It was 1991. I will piggyback on what Devon said earlier. Why are we still doing this? But why are we still doing this? Because we believe it. I just retired recently from policing. Um, my new role is an honor to me. I'm the director uh, at Stan Daniels Healing Center, which is a self-administered Section 81 uh, federal healing lodge that uh, has 73 um, individuals who are on federal sentence sentences. We have another one called Buffalo Sage a few blocks away from me. And that ha has 28 women in that place. And when we start to talk about the things that we're talking about, I hear compassion and I hear procedural justice. And I hear where we're at, and we need to do better. And I hear, you know, we talk about neighborhoods, we talk about Minneapolis being a recent issue when when George Floyd was murdered. There was an article in the National Post, however, where, where a, a woman from an area that was high crime, she said, we don't want to defund the police. We just want the police to be here differently. And if you look at Mary Palato's uh, article that she wrote, it's an academic article called Sweet Mothers and Gangbangers. It's not necessarily about police legitimacy, but what it is about is we want the police there, but we want them there differently. I will go out on a limb and say this, defund the police is a virtue of the privileged because oftentimes individuals that need the police and live in marginalized areas that have high crime, they need the police, but I agree with them, they need the police to be there different. In my other life, in my other world, I uh, dipped back into academia. I'm just about finished my PhD and all my research is on the victim offender overlap, <clears throat> looking at the pre-victimization of, of individuals with offending behavior and how that affects their life course. We've, with, it's a, with the University of Alberta Prison Project, I've interviewed over 800 
incarcerated men and women. And we've found that 95% of men and 97% of women have experienced violence or sexual violence prior to their, uh, sorry, in their life. And it, it's roughly 83 and 85% of them have experienced that prior to their first detected uh, offense at roughly the average age of nine. So when we start to think about compassion and trauma-informed policing, and we start to think, what is it that we do? And what is it that policing is? And we start to think, what is it that justice is? And I think it goes beyond the police. I think we need to start looking at justice systems as a whole. We start need to start looking in correctional facilities and how we're interacting with individuals. Right now, there's there as we sit here, there's 40,000 Canadians incarcerated in Canadian prisons, and there's a high Indigenous population incarcerated there with a 53% increase, actually, in the incarceration of Indigenous people in the last 10 years. So what are we doing? And what are we doing wrong? And how does justice need to change? I look at the concept of compassionate or trauma-informed policing, and I start to think about my career as a police officer. And I start to think about the um, every second year I took first aid. Every second year I took first aid and I was taught universal precautions to sit and protect myself and to protect the individuals uh, who I was potentially saving. And when you start to look at the reasons for that bloodborne diseases and all kinds of things, and we, we talk about this, the necessity of that safety for us and for the individual, and 0.6% of the Canadian population has hepatitis C, 0.006% of the population has uh, HIV. And at the time I wrote the paper, 2.17% of the Canadian population had COVID-19 and we're all wearing these. When I go back to those numbers of the individuals that are incarcerated, we look at 95 and 97% have a victim background sitting in, in incarceration facilities. When we look at the social determinants of health and the social determinants of crime, those two things lay over each other like they're almost exactly the same, but we use a justice hammer to solve all social, all social issues. Policing needs to evolve and change beyond that. We need to be compassionate. We need to understand. We need to do. We need to train. We need to educate. Professor Bladford said he showed seven months of the average training of a Canadian police officer prior prior to um, them getting on the street. I wrote a paper years ago called "Policing as a Tradecraft," and I argued that policing is not a profession. It doesn't mean we can't be professional, but with the level of training that we get, we are a tradecraft. There's a lot of professional electricians out there but it's not a profession. If we wanna move into that world, if we wanna move into that space, there needs to be requirement for education, ongoing um, updating of a license, ensuring that we are evidence-based in our practices, ensuring that the practices do no harm. If you start to look at the ways we can do things differently, bringing procedural justice into things like focused deterrence, where you go meet your most violent individuals at their homes and talk with them and try to give them options other than crime. That worked in the Boston ceasefire experiment extremely well and prevented a high percentage of deaths from happening in 1994. We know these things exist out there. We know that they work, but because there's not a standardization in policing, we don't do hotspots policing, knowing that hotspots policing reduces crime by 30 to 80% in high crime areas with almost no um, diffusion and pushing it around to other neighborhoods. So knowing that and knowing these things, and that's where the College of Policing in the UK has, a, has, a, has an advantage is they bring those evidence-based practices to um, the police services and that provides the police services with the knowledge and then the ability to implement those 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 interventions um so all i'm saying is there's two things that we have to focus on we have to focus on yes we have to focus on standardization we also have to refocus on the community aspect of policing and being part of that community and one of the things i will tell you in my new role as the director of at stan daniels is i spend a lot of time with individuals who haven't been incarcerated some for in excess of 27 to 30 years. Um, and I spend time chatting with them and talking with them and being proximate to them. Other people that I used to work with in policing are like, uh, have, a, uh, have a challenge reconciling that I'm working in a, in a space with individuals who have federal sentences and don't have, we don't have locked doors, we don't have handcuffs, we don't have cells, we don't have any weapons. And I feel extremely safe in there. You know why? Because we're proximate to each other and proximity breeds care and proximity breeds love and distance breeds fear. And if we, if we fear people, and that could be communities, if we're not proximate to indigenous communities in Edmonton, 
if I don't know indigenous people and if I don't have indigenous people in my in my space in my circle in my in my world if I don't know black people if I don't get out of my comfort zone as a white privileged man and go and 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 maybe go to a powwow maybe go to a, a black church and experience the community and be proximate and if you do that and if we do that if we find ways to get police proximate to people I guarantee you procedural justice will fall in place. I guarantee you, you'll see crime go down. And I guarantee you, you'll see a better um, policing, uh, level of policing out there in this great country. And with that, I'm, I'm concluded what I have to say. And now we have a question period and I see there's some questions in the Q and A and I will go into those. <clears throat> First one from Daniel Belgard. Anyone, this is to anyone, uh, how can we include police governance or the boards or commissions in the college or should we? Actually, if I could jump in, I, I typed an answer to that one, but I'll just follow up on it. That hmm. the, the inclusion of the boards, uh, I think what you need to do is, it, it all depends upon what is going to be the areas of responsibility assigned to the different areas. And it, it, how is the, uh, the college structured, what are the areas of responsibility and how are they all going to work together? So that would have to be something that's established when you're building the framework. And again, it ties into that. Is it a regulatory body or is it an advisory body? And that will dictate, but you know, uh, th things like uh, the SIU in Ontario, they would still remain in place. They would still have their mandate. They would still do what they're supposed to do. And when it comes to, as I discussed about the, the, uh, uh, licensing of police officers or the certification that would only be a, at the end of the process the the college itself wouldn't be responsible for revoking that license until everything has gone through full investigation and full due process uh consistent with procedural justice and it would only be at the last step that as part of that the college could revoke that licensing so the, the boards and, and commissions would still remain fairly independent i think and then would still uh, retain their authority and they would work in partnership and in collaboration and they wouldn't be replaced uh, by the college. My thoughts. I would agree with those thoughts. You know, remember what I said, this is about recognizing a symbiotic nature of the relationship. For too often, these really important uh, agencies in the overarching community and public safety forum have acted in isolation. Everyone felt this is my domain, this is my domain, without understanding that we have a common goal in mind. So I would agree with you 100%. Yes, you have your own individual mandate and responsibility, but we have a collective goal and a purpose in mind. So it has to be the nature of that symbiotic relationship. Nobody just operating in isolation. What you do impacts the other component. I think that's what we need to transition to. Thank you both for that. I think that's great. Did you wanna? Anyone else want to pipe in there, Eileen? Did you want to say anything on that, or are you good with that? Okay. Uh, the next question, again, is from Daniel Bel Belgard, uh, from, for Devon. This one specifically for Devon. We don't have to look at the USA for use of force instance. We can look at the Winnipeg Police Service, Thunder Bay, and the RCMP across the West and North. But I want to ask about the issues of real crime, and we can manage the differences of inherent in the provision of police services in large municipal services and small towns or RCMP detachments in terms of national standards. Well, I would agree with you that no, we don't necessarily need to look at the US, but I think we need to look at that particular incident because as I said, it was global. It really was. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we can no longer think about that it's just within our area because something in Winnipeg can have the same massive global impact. So that's what I'm trying to get at. And that's why I said across our country, we can say, well, this is my standard, you know, on the East Coast and the prairies and on the West. That's why we need national standards. And uh, what was the second part of the question, Dan? Rural crime? Yeah, rural, how does rural, with the, the rural crime, how do, we, how do we manage that? Well, again, I don't think we need to necessarily need to draw a serious distinction. No different than I'm saying that policing on the East Coast shouldn't be different. Whether you're living in a rural or you're living in a major uh, city, you should expect the same level of police service right across the board. And that is where, again, a national standard would really impact that. So that doesn't matter where you are, police, we should have the same level of policing. Why should we say, because you're living in the rural areas, here's what you should get. Uh, for example, when I look at policing on First Nations communities, why should we have these different standards? 
And again, I think a national college would actually help to address that. So every province isn't trying to wrestle with it on their own. I agree. I agree with this. Uh, I, I think, you know, the idea of standardization is, is, you know, with respect to training is great because, but policing has to be flexible. This is not pure science. Policing is not pure science and is a humanities, right? So it has to be adaptable to the needs of the various communities that, uh, that, that you're actually serving, first of all, and protecting as well. So, so, you know, whether it's rural or whether it's, uh, it, it, you know, I mean, I mean, I deal, I deal with issues of racial profiling and I know we, I didn't talk about this here, but, uh, and so racial profiling, whether, whether, it's, whether it's conducted in Vancouver, whether it's conducted in, in Manitoba or whether it's conducted in Quebec, the only difference being it's in French, uh, it has the same repercussion on the people in the community. So uh, I'm not, uh, I think policing, has to be flexible and adaptable. Otherwise, we're just a bunch of robots. If I could just jump in on that, and, and I completely agree with you, what, what I'd suggest is that there has to be a certain base level, and that's where I, I suggest that the education levels and the competency development comes from. But then the training allows for those localized concerns to be addressed. So there is a standard base across policing with the addition of those localized concerns that are specific to that area that could be addressed through uh, training and experience sort of on the ground in that area. And I think that's where you get that, that uh, you know, specialization for that particular area uh, to come through. But, but good point, Elaine. Thanks very much. The next question actually, I think feeds off this last one quite well. Given the hegemony of the RCMP and Canadian policing acting as federal, provincial, municipal police, the latter under contract, how does one convince the RCMP to relinquish, relinquish their believed dominance and accept a professional police body that would question and reform their current practices? Thank you from Peter. It's quite the challenge, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody will want to deal with this. Um... <laughs> I'll deal with it. I don't think it's a challenge. As I said, when you look at the time that we're in, this pussyfooting around and saying, okay, can it be this, can it be that? We're going to fail if we say we do need to have these different levels. That is exactly what the college would be about. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It is about a national policing standard that applies to every single person who calls himself a police officer in this country. Here's a standard. You can do your things locally. You know, as Scott said, in terms of the local feel, but here are this base level that everyone should adhere to. Just think about it for a second. Why are we even having this discussion at this day and time in our country? Like we have one of the best policing environments across the globe. There'll be greater challenges ahead of us. How do we better prepare ourselves to be able to address them? You know, like I said, I've sat around the table decades ago where people are talking about, we're just not there yet. I'm sorry, we're there. So there's, it's, this is the path forward. It really is. Uh, I, I agree. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to suggest, I think what you're talking about here is, is a change in culture that it has to happen. And it's the same that's happened with Toronto Police and other major police organizations. And change in a culture comes about in two ways. It either comes about generationally, where it takes years and years of bringing in new blood, so to speak, to, to change it, or it requires a seismic event, something traumatic that will change it. And I think by creating the, the standards across the country through a college of policing, that's that seismic event that will lead towards that cultural change. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like the idea of a seismic event, but at the same time, um, what's the incentive uh, for those, those agencies to adhere to that national standard? Now, then, then we, we have to go to the idea that policing is a, is a dual responsibility, federal and provincial. And if the College of Policing is, 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 is going to be this federal entity supported by at the federal level, it, it can create um, standards, minimum standards, to which uh, local, provincial, and municipal agency would have to adhere to in order to benefit through provincial funding in some of their activities. Uh, and, and I think money speaks, you know, money talks uh, when it comes to federal monies. 
And so if you want to get federal monies, then you would have to meet the standards that the College of Policing would, would have put in place. So that's why I think getting that support at the federal level, and, and I think it's a responsibility, much like uh, health care, standardization of health care across the board is, is a federal, uh, or at least the federal has taken on that responsibility with respect to the, uh, the, the AIDS, but the <laughs> COVID crisis. So anyway, those are my sort of thoughts. Can, can I add some, Scott, were you were going to say something or can I add something? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you raise a good point, Alan. You say, what's the incentive? So let me tell you what I see the incentive is. I can tell you after George Floyd, and I'm retired, I know many police officers showed up at my door because they were in serious pain in terms of what they're dealing with and the trauma. I can tell you, and again, you know, the question of, we don't need US examples, but the pain that I see here working in the US that officers are experiencing, when I speak with the community, the pain that they're experiencing and we see what the fix is. So when you talk about what the incentive is, the incentive is the pain that both police and community are going through. But here I can tell you within the American context, the pain is the tens of millions of dollars that cities are paying out. Maybe not to the same extent in our country, but it will get there. And we have an opportunity to prevent all of that. And so anybody who would sit and say, well, this is my domain, like I'm retired now. And that's why I couldn't say what I'm saying if I was still in the inspectorate role. And that's part of why I wanted to retire. I think there are some things that need to be said. Enough of this, right? People are hurting severely because people are sitting saying, this is my domain. No, we're here to serve the community and the officers are hurting and the community is hurting. And this is actually the solution. So I'll step in front of anyone and tell them very clearly, enough is enough. We know how to lead people forward and this is the path that we must take. That's the incentive. That's what we're set up to do. That's our purpose. Yeah, I would agree. There's There's been a general change in how police are, are perceived in the country. And it, it's not the same as it was when I started back in 1982. There's a, there's a definite shift in what's happening. And I think social media, uh, increased globalization, expectations uh, have all changed and have all put pressures on police organizations to be more responsive. And I see us becoming more and more every day like the states. And I don't want to go down that path. I think we're better than that. And I, I think the way to avoid that is by creating these national standards that create a minimum level of expectations with the ability to tailor it to localized needs and expectations. And whether it takes a constitutional change to the, the legislation governing who's responsible for policing, or as, as Elaine uh, refers to, hit them in the, the wallet. Don't give them the transfer payments if they don't abide by the, the, uh, the standards. But there has to be a shift and it, it has to be something that is I think dramatic in that it gets everyone's attention and gets the ball moving. If I may make a comment as well, uh, Bruce just put in here, may I suggest the RCMP involvement will be a political decision. How will the federal government be convinced to lose control of their police agency? And just something that a lot of people may not know, a bipartisan report was put out early in the spring of last year that says the Canadian government wants the RCMP out of provincial policing and out of contract policing. That was put together by both the, the by both governments. Put, put out there so so that's that's one thing the other thing is and i and i i think and this is just me and when we talk about seismic events i think we've had it we had a seismic event again and i think we had george floyd is that seismic event that 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 rattled policing all across this country and i can tell you um i there were days where i came home and wanted to quit uh, i wanted to quit because i there's parts of policing that i disagree with there's parts of our justice system I disagree with, but I also gave up 25 years of my life um, for what I believed is, is a, as a noble profession. But I also want to say this, and I think Devon hit it on the nose. If we don't do this, and that seismic event isn't enough, if the murder of a Black man on TV at the hands of a police officer isn't enough of a seismic event, then the next generation of police will see us and the next generation of community will see us as failures. And I would suggest, and I'm gonna make a bold comment that policing as we see it will not survive. And you're going to start seeing people go, you know what, we're gonna hire private police, we're gonna have a private security, we're gonna, we're gonna challenge all these things. We've seen that happen in the States. We've seen gated communities that have armed security that police those communities because there's been a loss of trust and a loss of belief in what the police, the, the legitimacy of the power that the police hold. So to me, in my humble opinion, that seismic event has happened and we better get in line and we better make those changes. 
Yeah. Well, we could have uh, we could have a whole webinar on this particular seismic event. Um, I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna I got to tell you, I, I, I've last for the last for the last four years, I've been involved in in these kind of conversations, uh, you know, with community groups and also with institutions. And, I, and the George Floyd event was a seismic event, maybe for about six months. Uh, then, 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 uh, what happened was in policing is that the police officers or, or the word depolicing resurfaced again because it periodically it resurfaces when when police practices are challenged. And uh, and if you look across the board, you know, if, if, if you're interested in a, in, a, in a very good research that was conducted by Dr. Greg uh, Brown, who used to be a police officer in Ottawa, as if you, some of you know, may know him, uh, his, uh, his dissertation, his PhD dissertation thesis on depolicing, that's quite scary. Okay, and and it's uh, and it's something that's happening across Canada it, as a result of, as uh, Scott mentioned, the 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 well, it's 21st century policing, including including the media portrayal of police, the use of camera, with the ubiquitous use of video cameras everywhere, and uh, and so on, and, and police officers claiming that. Uh, that they just want to quit the job. I mean, in Quebec here, it's the boogeyman. Everybody wants to quit the job, according to the unions. Um, I'm not. I'm not convinced that is. You know, I mean, that's a serious issue. But I think there's different ways of going about it. And I think, going back to picking up on uh, Scott's point, I think, uh, from my perspective, I think it'll have to be through uh, training of new, the new blood coming in, because folks. That are in the force and the police and that's been in the police for 15, 10, 15 years. They're not going to change. Not, there's no there's no amount of incentive that's going to make them change. And I, you know, and and this and by the way, the George Floyd incident from a, for a lot of police officers, that's just the, the United States. They have nothing to do with Canada. So uh, so I'm I'm a little bit uh, like I said I I get a little skeptical when folks start talking about that stuff. I think. What we're doing in terms of the college of policing is the right way of doing it. It's the right way of going about it, and I think. Uh, but I think the new generation will be the ones that need to be go put through, you know, procedural justice and all those type of very new way of of doing business. And 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 uh, so we have to be patient. We're old folks, but I think we can contribute to to the new generation that's coming up. So, so Lane, let me give you a little hope because as I told you this week, all I've been doing is talking to police officers and community members. I'm working across three communities in the US right now. George Floyd hasn't gone away. That's all they're talking about. But here's the thing. Not in the US, not in the US, in the, not in the US, I can tell you that, I know, I know. Yeah, I, but there's hope because you know what? Those seasoned officers, like that was a seismic moment. People have seen it and there was a shift. But I can tell you, after that thing occurred, officers were showing up at my home in Winnipeg. And, and I really, I think the pandemic is taken front and center. But as we come out of that, I honestly believe all this stuff is going to resurface and we're finding that. So I'm, opti I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll move forward. But if we don't address it and we think it's just gone, and it's going to go away on its own. I think it's going to come back worse than it was. So, but I'm hopeful. I really am. That was a, a great discussion on that topic. I pre we could we could probably do a whole day on that. Um, uh, just a comment here from uh, Daniel Belgrade, uh, Belgard. Actually, we want our own people involved in community safety on our reserves. The File Hills First Nations Police Service are recruiting from within and are succeeding, which is an ex outstanding example. The File Hills Police Service um, is is an exceptional Canadian example of self administered policing. And Jackie Laporte just made a comment there. That's great to hear. I do not live on reserve, but in a very rural area, uh, all of our community youth that want to become police officers do so outside of our community, which is, which is, which is something that we need to find ways to rectify. Uh, and that again, that's another, that's another topic. And uh, one of the things that I think needs to happen just on that first, just if I can make a quick comment, I used to be the chair of the First Nations and Métis and Inuit Peoples Policing Committee for the CACP, which is now Indigenous Peoples Policing Committee. And the, the still, and even to this day, uh, the not equal payments for self-administered policing, they're not paid the same as municipal counterparts. They are not, they don't get to be in the same 
Um, the individuals on First Nations policing or self immersed policing don't have the same benefits. They don't have the same pension benefits. And it's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's inappropriate. And I look at my own, uh, I'm a self-administered, uh, we're a self-administered Section 81 correct, uh, facility under Correctional Service of Canada as a healing lodge. And my parole officers make half of what the CSC parole officers make. And there is, there needs to be some accountability to government to say, if we are really supporting First Nations uh, communities working in that, in those spaces, then we actually have to do it. We don't have to do it as a cost saving um, effort on behalf of the, on behalf of the federal government. And that's my opinion on that. Um, I got a question here from uh john Lilly, if if chief tamaklo was available could he describe his perception of police when he arrived in canada 30 years ago and has the perception changed i don't think he's available i haven't seen him pop up yet so so i yeah i, I can only i i i think um i can only i can only say right now from from working with the communities uh, in quebec montreal and also in Ontario, in many the black community, particularly, um, it's a tough, tough, tough situation. A tough sale. Policing is a tough sale, uh, and uh, and one of the issue is the uh, you know lack of transparency, a lack of I think openness, and there's resentment of both sides. So it's an us against them kind of mentality, and uh, I, I admire what. You know the work that Devin is doing in the United States in opening up those communication channels and and having folks engaging in in conversations because um, that is that is something that without which I, I you my know hand. I oh go ahead uh, Mr. yeah hello can you hear me hello oh there he is hello sir how are you I didn't see you <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, 30 years ago, um, I'm not sure from the policing perspective what I, whether something has changed or not, but I'm sure I have changed a lot. I've learned a lot more about policing. And I think uh, with the knowledge I have, uh, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people understand that uh, policing is not uh, uh, where it should be in terms of uh, being a professional, uh, uh, standardized, uh, 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 I, I mean, it's not professionally standardized as it should be. And so with the kinds of knowledge that we have today, I think we can move forward, advocate for a more standardized uh, uh, policing environment so that our police officers can be more successful in the work that they do and, and our community can be more satisfied with the kind of service that the police uh, provide. Thank you so much. Um, there's another comment here, and I just I'll, I'll, I'll give this shout out as well. I'll take in from Peter Koppel. Take a look at Sutsina Nation Police Service. In my opinion, one of the best community-based policing services. I, I can't agree with you more. Uh, Keith, Keith, Chief Keith Blake, uh, they do amazing work there. The community it loves them, and they recently just actually took over policing a non uh, a non-indigenous community right beside the the nation. So. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're bang on and Bruce says the same thing, bang on. Um, Nancy Monoton says, when did our police services become so militarized and uniform in approach rather than the relational community oriented practices I've experienced when my kids were little and what are we do, hoping to, and what are we hoping to reintroduce? Um, I, I, for me, I, we, there's been, there were events in the world that happened and the police started to, um, respond in that way and we follow the Americans the American model a little bit too heavily in my opinion um, and we really need to return to the community it was actually it's funny that question is still uh, there in 2017 I was at a justice conference and said police um, are losing community support and there will be a matchbox incident in the next three to five years that results uh, in a change of policing forever and we need to return to the community before that happens uh, interestingly enough, I got into a lot of trouble for making that comment um, from my chief of police at the time, um, because he didn't agree that I should make that type of comment in 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 the public space. Um, and I truly believe that we need to have those comments in the public space. We need to have conversations like this that are open and honest and shows the vulnerability of policing, so that we can get back to that community oriented policing that I uh, I that I loved my whole career. 
Dan, if I could just jump in here too, I was just actually typing an answer to that question. And uh, when did it happen? It happened right around the time that the US pulled out of Iraq after the Iraq war and began to surplus all their military equipment to police organizations across the states. And that's when you saw their police services starting to you know, tack up. And at the same time, Canadian police services started to see that and it started to spill over. It's right around that same time that we went to the dark blue shirts. It's right around the same time we went to the external vest carriers because it created that same military look and it was a spillover from the states. And it's because of the surplusing of all the military equipment that came out of the Iraq war. That I think had a uh, had a huge shift in uh, the policing uh, perspectives and, and the perception of the public. And I think 9-11 also made a big yeah. impact where it was this, it became, well, we we're at some semblance of war. And um, and I, and I, I, so I agree hundred percent with you. And I think nine 11 had another impact on that. And I, and I, and it's, in my opinion, it's psychologically sometimes easier to be distanced from the community. And if we have those walls built up and we have our, our uniforms built up, that's them. It's that it's happening to them. It's not happening to us. And I, and I truly believe that we, okay. we don't understand that when you get the okay. compassion piece, it brings back. Okay, uh, when you get the compassion piece, it brings back it. You actually it fills your bucket, right? Yeah, uh, your your and I don't think we teach police that enough that that those compassionate interactions actually will will help us and and make us feel better. Like, if I may, for one quick second, tell a super fast story and the, the story is of my one of the, a young woman who I arrested in two thousand and six and have maintained connection with her throughout the years. And I'm walking her down the aisle on April twenty second. Uh, she lost her father when she was 16, lost her mother when she was 12. And that was a relationship that was born out of a, of a wiretap related to gangs. So I, I think we need to give our members permission to see people's whole stories because in policing, we see chapter five. We have no idea what happened one through four and we never or very rarely get to read chapters uh, six through 12. And I think that's one of those things where that proximity piece comes into play. Yeah, 100%. And I think... And again, I'm going back to this idea of recruiting. We need to recruit folks that will think in terms of service. And I know it's it's the the old warriors versus service mentalities, but but I think but I think there's there's a lot of truth behind behind these two different uh, ways of of doing the work that that we're sworn to to do. And uh, and I think the you know the United States. It does, regardless of, of what's happening in the United States, we, it has an automatic effect on Canada. When the United States catches a cold, we, you know, we get COVID or something. Um, you know, it's inevitable, and and that that's not just policing. That's not just policing. That's that's also, uh, you know, uh, public or 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 so I was going to say music, uh, crime types of criminalities. I. I, I you know, I was in drug squad for 10 years in the midst of the war on drugs in the United States and everything that was happening in the United States, you know, we felt that there was the same thing happening here in Canada. Um, and so there's nothing really new here, but but I think what I'm hearing from Devin, again, I'm very I'm very optimistic and I'm I'm hoping that we will we will get some of that um, some of that good vibes coming to Canada as well in terms of uh, getting engaged in communities and policing. And talking to one another. Thank you. So the another, next, this is another question uh, from uh, Daniel Belgard. RCMP applications in Saskatchewan in the past were heavily weighted towards small town and farming communities. Now young people are leaving small towns for the city, and farms are disappearing. They are, they are, these are corporate farms. The structure and culture of policing has to change to attract recruits. Any ideas? Yeah. Again, I mean, it's you know, if you if you build it, they will come. It's, and if you you have to have the, the big sign on the door has to be to serve and protect. We're here to serve, so you have to to attract people that want to serve and not just catch bandits. I joined the police. Uh, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you. I joined policing to catch bandits. Might have been the wrong attitude, but that's what attracted me to policing. Uh, you know, I mature along the way, but but if we go and seek people that are that are there to kick ass and take names, that's who we're going to get. And then 
and then we have to live with the consequences. So I think it starts with recruiting, uh, then training, supervising, uh, managing, correcting when, when needed, and all the way through the pension. And it has to be right across the board. Uh, otherwise, we'll keep on doing the same thing and, get not, and not get different results. If I might add to that too, I think one of the problems is, is that there somehow has been a devaluation of frontline policing. It, it's, that's something that you do in order to get to where you actually want to go. Uh, I remember I had students all the time that would say, yeah, I want to be a police officer. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to be an inspector. I said, well, yeah, so do I. But do you realize that that's a rank and it's not an actual position? But again, television has, has created these false narratives about what policing actually is. And along the way, frontline policing is something that's just to be got through so you can get to the good jobs. You can go to canine, you can go to tactical, you can go wherever you want to go. And I think what we need to do is we need to, to raise the perceived value of that frontline policing and include the fact that you're making a contribution to the community. And you're not just, as, as Elaine said, you know, kicking ass and taking names, but you're making contribution to the community at a community level. And I think you'll attract a different type of person to that job. And that would open up your candidate pool, I think, a lot broader. I agree with you about the frontline policing and I, and I tell everyone my hall of fame jersey in policing was my beat time. I walked a foot yeah. patrol in one of the highest crime areas in Edmonton and I maintain relationships with people from that community to this day. And I became part of the fiber fiber of that community. And the other thing I think we need to do in policing is start looking at different hiring practices too. Yeah. Uh, we have a really cool story in Edmonton here, um, a young guy and he's, he's, there's been, a, there was an article on him in, in one of the newspapers. He, um, is indigenous. He was unfortunately uh, his his mom died when he was young, and so did he had he had no connection with his father. Ended up in foster care, ended up arrested as a young offender, convicted of a crime. Ended up arrested as an adult, convicted of a crime. Got a pardon, went to school, became an engineer, and always wanted to be a police officer. And he said the reason he wanted to be a police officer was in his life, when the only time he felt calm was when the police officers entered the house to stop whatever. Um, person was assaulting him his brother or his mother and yeah he went down a nasty path for a while but he wrecked he 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 turned that corner he got a pardon and he got hired and I can tell you that hire happened within the last four years I would guarantee you that that wouldn't have happened uh, five to, to 10 to 15 years ago that we hired someone with a pardon who had actually been incarcerated Elaine Yeah, real, yeah, real quick. I think it's Vancouver City Police that uh, VPD that got in trouble recently with their recruiting ads, if I'm not mistaken. I know it's a police service out west where they all they were they 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 had were you know tech teams going in and kicking doors and the you know, the big flares and everything, and and that was the recruiting ad for the police service. And only I mean it, it created a flurry of um, protests and, and complaints from from a lot of communities that you know you those are the people you want to get i mean you know this is what policing is all about and so i think beyond the rhetoric we have to project the image that we need people that are there as you pointed out to serve the communities that are there for the people and not simply there to 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 to, to you know again kick, kick ass and take names One last question, and then I just want to make a couple of comments just to close out. Um, the last comment is, any thoughts on how we get the RCMP union in, on board as they view a college as opponent in competition from Bruce? Um, I think, and it's any every single police association, right? I think we need to have those uh, conversations and address those things. Um, and I think that's, and we go back to, I think Devin earlier said, and Elaine, legislation. Legislation supersedes these things, and then you, 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 they don't get to, to see it as competition. You either do it or you don't get licensed. And if you don't get licensed, you don't work here anymore. You know, it's not quite as, as drastic as what they did in Camden, New Jersey. And if anyone's familiar with Camden, New Jersey, uh, Chief Neil Thompson laid the entire organization off and then rehired people that were, that, that were, had the right mindset. Now, if anyone needs to watch it, go on YouTube, watch Not In My Town, Camden, New Jersey. It's an outstanding way of seeing that, catas not catastrophic, but the, uh, uh, the huge event that resulted in a change in policing in a community that was the most violent city in the world at the time. Um, and it was insane. So you have that amazing 
uh, we have that amazing opportunity to do this just a little bit differently. And if you're not going to get on board and it's legislative, you need to be licensed through the college and you're not li licensed through the college, then you find a new job. And I think we have to be that prescriptive. And that's just my opinion. I think part of it as well is you have to remove that adversarial perspective. It's not, you know, the college against the union. It's there. You have to show that there's a symbiotic relationship there and that they're actually working collaboratively. And part of the way you do that is to bring the unions into a, setting up the colleges and the, creating the standards. And that way they have a buy into the process. But I mean, it, it's the same as, and uh, Devin probably experienced this as the inspector general. As soon as you talk about the word audit, it suddenly creates a, you know, this false sense of panic and a, a, an audit or creating some form of oversight is not necessarily always bad as long as it's done with input from those people involved. And I think that's part of the problem. The communication piece is going to be crucial to getting buy-in from the associations and the, the, uh, the unions and such. And yeah, legislation is going to create it, but it's going to take cooperation to make it work. I agree with you 100%, Scott. What we did with the inspectorate, we met with every single police chief and command staff individually, unions individually, every board individually. Everybody recognized that we were there to help them to serve, to make this job better for every single one. And by the time we established it, every single person was in support, every agency. So you gotta take time. It takes time to build that kind of consensus. And in the past, yes, if we need legislation, but that I believe if we do it right, remember that people have a stake in the game and you. You give them time, you won't need legislation because at the end of the day, we're in it for their well being, not because we want to build an empire. We want to make this better for you. People will see that. 100% agree. And actually, uh, uh, former Chief Dave Castles just put in the, the, in the one chat that the Canadian Police Association is on side with the college. The RCMP union is sitting on the fence, but they're working on communication with them. So, again, I think we said hope earlier, so that's great. So that's the final questions. I just want to make just a couple final comments. First of all, I put a link into our national uh, Canadian Police uh, Coalition. Uh, that's Thank you very much, Josh has put up there. The Coalition for Canadian Police Reform Conference. Uh, democracy, democracy Counts Towards Systemic Police Reform for Canada, June 14th to 16th. Uh, and it's a virtual platform. So there's going to be more of these discussions. There's going to be more of, uh, of, of these talks there's going to be more action and i think we are going to start having to um, you know build up what we can do to develop this this college um i know we've i know i i'm sure that uh, they've talked to peter nehrud over in the uk who developed the college over there uh, and i know i know they have because uh, I, I knew that so i think the next move is just to continue moving in this direction uh gaining support getting um, people uh, that understand the importance of this and also getting people that can discuss this with a little bit of friction because it, we can't just have a whole bunch of like-minded people talking about this. We need to we need to get some people that with a little bit of difference and we need to think differently and do things differently. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you again to every one of the panelists that came today. Um, it was, you know, it's Friday, Friday night. Who, who's, who thought we'd have, you know, 30 some people on a Friday night uh, and the war and the weather is nice actually in Edmonton here there's sun shining and and my wife sending me text that she wants to have a glass of wine soon so um so um I just wanted to say thank you to everybody thank you for for the coalition for organizing this and I was honored to moderate this session and uh and if there's any comments from the final comments from the panelists uh, there please make them if not everyone have an excellent night Beautiful. Thanks, everybody. And, uh, uh, and have a, a, an excellent weekend. And everyone, please stay safe. Good night, all. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Good night, everybody.